Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Apologies, this is our first webinar for the year, so we're all allowed to have some gremlins in the works. Um, quickly before we start, well, first of all, welcome to this Mpumalanga Centre webinar, which is titled Modelling Approach to Certify the Accuracy Class of CTs and VTs, um, presented by Mr. Alexander Diaz. Before we start, just a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on their device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. By default, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of the presentation will be made available on the SAIE YouTube channel, SAIE TV. The recording will also be made available on the SAIE website under the events drop down menu in the section past events and webinars. This page is updated regularly, so ensure you check back as often as possible for new uploads and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more uploads. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar, once we have received the CPD validation number from EXA. I hand you now over. I'll introduce you to Mr. Oki Ulifi. He is a member of the SRE Mpumalanga Center. Oki holds a bachelor degree in electrical and electronic engineering from the University of Stellenbosch. Nor Consult Leander currently employs him as a senior engineer and location manager for the Secunda branch. Oki is also an active member of the SIE, serving on the SIM Pumalanga Centre Committee. Oki. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Also, welcome to this SIE event from my side. Uh, I would like to introduce you to our presenter this evening, uh, Mr. Alex DX. Um, so Alexander has over 30 years of experience in protective relays metering testing and high voltage plant testing. He received his uh, practical training at ESCOM distribution in Drakenfeld before joining Omnicron Electronics GmbH in Austria as a sales and applications engineer. Since uh, 1997, he's, uh, managing, um, uh, he's managing electrics which is the exclusive distributor of Omnicron equipment in South Africa. Um, Alex has delivered dozens of papers at local and international conferences and symposiums on subjects such as protective relay testing, maintenance and diagnosis of power transformers, current transformers and other substation assets and aspects of power system simulations. Uh, with that, I hand over to you, Alex. Thank you, Oki. Um, I just want to take a grab of the presentation. I just want to see here. Dashboard sharing. Why don't I see the audience view? To change one, and I want to see the monitor too clean. Just want to make sure, can you see my opening slide, Okay, Can you just confirm that for me, please? Yes, I can see. You can see that, perfect. Good, so good afternoon to everybody. Um, thank you very much for um, joining this webinar this afternoon and also um, giving us the time to listen to the topic of modeling approach to certify the accuracy class of current transformers as well as voltage transformers. I took the liberty of extending the title a little bit and um, call it now the using a modeling approach to certify the accuracy class of metering class current transformers and voltage transformers according to IEC 60044 as well as IEC 61869. Just a presentation overview. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of background and an introduction to the whole topic. Why do we need to calibrate and how do we need to test um, CTs and VTs according to the standards that I've already mentioned, 60044 and 
61869. We are then going to dive into the mathematical model of a current transformer. I will also present to you a test solution to characterize the CT model um, as with the Omicron CT analyzer. And then we're going to have a look at some very interesting case studies for both class M or metering class CTs as well as protection class CTs. In the second portion, we will look at the mathematical model of a voltage transformer, which is actually quite similar to a current transformer with um, a few distinct differences. Again, we, I'm going to present to you the test solution to characterize the VT model with the Omicron Votan 100. And then we're also going to look at some very interesting case studies for metering class VTs as well as class 3P, which is a protection class VT. We're also going to talk a little bit about the certification and calibration of this calibration equipment or this test equipment. And then we're going to close with a summary and some conclusions. And we will have plenty of time for questions and a discussion afterwards. As already mentioned, if you have any questions, please type them in the questions area on the right hand side. And um, I will then attend to those questions afterwards. If it's too many questions, I will also respond to those questions in a summary after the webinar. It obviously all depends on the time that we have available. So what is the motivating factor for testing and calibrating CTs and VTs? And if we look at the NRS 057 standard of 2009 or the very similar South African national standard 474 also of 2009, we read in chapter 4.4.3.4 this, this, um, this passage, subsequent recalibration of metering system components requires the same full laboratory process as for new components. On-site testing and calibration is acceptable for this purpose as long as the requirements of this code of practice are complied with. The important point here is the on-site testing and calibration that needs to be done to comply with this standard. What are metering components? Well, the metering components consist of obviously the energy meter itself, as well as the instrument transformers, particularly if you're looking at high voltage installations. The focus of our presentation here today is the verification and the, um, the calibration of the instrument transformers, which consists of current transformers, as well as voltage transformers, because current times voltage obviously is then the power that is measured by a customer. Just a word about calibration. Recalibration or calibration, if you Google it, you'll find that it actually means, by definition, a comparison or a verification of the accuracy. So calibration doesn't mean that we're fiddling with the CT or the VT. It may, basically means just comparing it to a standard and certifying that the CT and the VT is still accurate. The calibration of inductive CTs is defined in IEC 60044-1 or IEC, the new IEC 61869-2. They are very similar, these two standards, just that the IEC 61869 is much newer than the older IEC 60044 standard. And the standard, um, as or SENS 474, actually refers to these standards for CT testing. What it means, what we basically require in that stand is that an accuracy verification is done at 5%, 20%, 100%, and 120% of a nominal current, both at quarter burden and at full burden connected to the CT. And I think that's an important point to make, that it's both quarter burden and full burden connected to the CT, not only full burden connected to CT, or not no burden connected to a CT, like for instance, if you have a short circuit connected to a CT, that basically means no burden connected to a CT. And that is not what is specified in the standard. For CTs, there is a very similar specification. It's a slightly different um, chapter in both these standards. It's IEC 60044-2, as well as IEC 61869-3, that refers to VTs. And here, they specify that an accuracy verification of a metering VT needs to be done at 80, 100 and 100, 20% of nominal voltage, again, both at quarter burden and at full burden, and 
a VT normally has multiple windings and um, or often has multiple windings. And if its VT does have such multiple windings, the um, other windings need to be tested with both being unloaded as well as being fully loaded. And the effect of that, I'll explain a bit later in my presentation when we talk about the modeling of VTs. And that's a very important consideration to look at. And that also complicates the calibration of VTs greatly because you can't just test one winding of a VT on its own. You always need to consider it together with the other windings as well. Inside the standard also, we find the accuracy to which these VTs and CTs need to be calibrated as well as also how often they need to be verified or the interval at which they need to be calibrated. And this really depends on the customer load. For large customers or, or customer loads of bigger than 10 MVA, the CT and the VT accuracy is specified as class 2. And these CTs and VTs need to be verified every five years. For medium-sized customers between 100 kVA and 10 MVA, the accuracy class is 0.5. And this needs to be done every 10 years. And for small customers, less than 100 kVA, the VT and the CT accuracy is class 1, 1%. And this needs to be done every 20 years. And this really is the important point that the standard specifies that both, or, or actually I should say all three, CTs, VTs, and the energy meter need to be verified and calibrated. For instance, in the case of a large consumer of bigger than 10 MVA, every five years to an accuracy of class 0.2. And this really is quite a challenge to the metering departments around the industry. How do you achieve that? I mean, to calibrate a CT and VT in conventional purposes is often done by primary injection because you then inject a primary current, for instance, if you're testing a VT as a CT, I mean, and you're measuring the secondary side of the current very accurately. And if you're in a laboratory type environment, this is reasonably easy to achieve. Again, within reason, obviously. But now this standard is now specifying this kind of accuracy to be done, and this kind of calibration to be done in the field. Well, it's very difficult to transport all your primary equipment, all your reference CTs and VTs, all your sources. You will remember that you need to do the current injection at up to 120% of primary current and the voltage up to 120% of nominal voltage so you need to have voltage sources and current sources that can, can deliver such voltages and currents. And it's quite a challenge to get all of that out into the field. And this is really where the crux of this presentation and the modeling approach to calibrating CTs and VTs comes from, because there is a very convenient and good solution available to still achieve the same amount of accuracy in a much more convenient way. So let's move over to current transformers. And if we look at current transformers, if we look at an ideal current transformer, we have a primary conductor that is carrying a certain amount of current. And then we have the CT that sits around this primary conductor. And this CT, the secondary winding, has a certain number of turns around it. And the two are coupled by the magnetic field that is created by this primary conductor or the current carrying this primary conductor. And in an ideal CT, the current that is measured on the secondary side of the CT is inversely proportional to the number of turns that is on this um, uh, core that you see here. So if you, for instance, in this case, say you've got a thousand turns on this core around the conductor here, and you're carrying a thousand amps through this primary conductor, then you will measure exactly one amp on the secondary side here because it's one thousandth of one thousand amps, which gives you one amp. This is an ideal transformer, and this means that the losses are not considered. This assumes a complete ideal linking of the fluxes between the primary and the secondary. And that is when this transformation formula of N1 over N2, N1 in this case obviously is one because it's only one conductor. And then, if, for instance, in our example, a thousand turns of the secondaries means that the currents are inversely proportional to the number of turns. It's 1,000 amps on the, sorry, in one over in two. So one over 1,000 gives you one amp over 1,000 on the primary. So the same ratio, basically. 
Note that in an ideal current transformer, the connected burden is obviously not considered. It assumes a short circuit, and, but that is also a kind of unrealistic consideration to make. And also, we are not considering any losses or any errors in our seat. Let's look at a more realistic model for the current transformer. This is the typical textbook way of describing a transformer um, that, you, that you can do. You basically have a ideal transformation ratio here, what you see here between NP and NS, that is transforming the, the current from the primary to the secondary with an ideal transformer as I've described earlier. And then you have what we call the iron losses of our CT. And this is really modeling the losses of our transformers as well as also the copper losses of our CT. <clears throat> and then lastly, we have a burden connected on the secondary side of our CT here. The important point is this is the winding um, um, resistance or the secondary winding resistance of the CT is modeled by a pure resistance because it typically is purely resistive. And the iron losses are modeled by three components. Firstly, the hysteresis losses, which are um, modeled by nonlinear resistance. Then we have the inductance or this, um, the, 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 the magnetizing inductance of the CT, which is also a nonlinear um, inductance. And then we have the eddy losses, which in this case is not nonlinear, but it's highly frequency dependent. This inductance that we see here is basically what we are measuring if we mag curving a CT because you're measuring what is the inductance of the CT in the unsaturated state, and that gives us a certain amount of Henry's, and then when it's saturated, the, the curve flattens off, and that is then a different inductance. So this is basically the difference between these inductance, or the, 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 um, the uh, inductance being saturated and unsaturated. Now, when we are testing the CT, or when we are modeling the CT, the parameters that we need to determine are basically the parameters shown, number one, the secondary winding resistance. This is typically determined with a direct current applied to the secondary side of the CT. When we're applying a direct current, the importance or the reason why we're applying a direct current is because then we can measure just the resistance. However, when we're injecting current in this circuit here, assuming that this side is open circuit, we obviously need to wait for this inductance here to stabilize or to charge up. And that is important when you're doing this test that you wait for that to happen. So you can't just apply a DC current and then remove it again. Firstly, you will um, create big problems for yourself because you'll have a lot of charge in this inductance here. But secondly, also your measurement will not be very accurate. So it's very important that when you apply this DC current that you wait for the measurement to stabilize, then you take your uh, measurement, which is very simple, the voltage dropped across the secondary terminals divided by the current that is flowing, that is actually then RCT, and then you need to discharge this inductance again before you can remove your test circuit. The second parameter that we need to determine is the nonlinear iron losses that we see in the middle here. And as I've already mentioned, those are three components. Firstly, it's the hysteresis losses, it's the eddy losses, as well as the in magnetizing inductance LN. These are two very long linear um, components. So we need to basically measure them both, for instance, the magnetizing inductance, both for the in, um, saturated state as well as the unsaturated state. And the eddy losses I've already mentioned are very frequency dependent. So we also need to test those at different frequencies to be able to um, characterize and understand them properly. And the last parameter that we need to determine is the ideal transformation ratio, which is the transformation ratio between the secondary and the primary. Once we have done the RCT and the nonlinear iron losses, this one is quite easy to do because all we need to do is we apply a voltage on this side and then we measure what comes out of the CT on the primary side here. And in that way, can determine what is the ideal transformation ratio. Typically, the transformation ratio for uncompensated CTs should be just a winding ratio. For instance, if it's a thousand to one CT, it should be a thousand windings on the secondary and one winding on the primary, for instance. 
But it's not always that, particularly in metering um, cities, you often have the effect that the um, windings are compensated, meaning that they're slightly adjusted to allow for the error that is flowing or that is happening in this, in this city due to this iron losses or this excitation current that is flowing in this specific case. Okay, so the next thing that we need to consider is that when this current is flowing here, this IP prime, which is the transformed primary current, is basically the ideal primary current or the ideal secondary current that is flowing. That then splits at this point into the excitation current as well as the secondary current that is then seen by the burden or that is coming out of the CT as such. You can also view this excitation current here as the error current of the CT or the reason why a CT is never 100% accurate because the current flowing here splits at this point here and only a portion of this um, current comes out. Obviously, the excitation current is much smaller than the secondary current, but it depends. So if we now look at this point at this point here, these two currents that are flowing here need to be added together to give you IP crime. But this addition of currents at this point here is the vectorial sum of currents because this current flowing through the magnetizing inductance here is obviously a lot more inductive. It's lagging the current that is flowing on the secondary side of the CT a lot more. If we draw a little vector diagram, we can see what happens. So IS is flowing here. That's the current that we have here. But the current that is flowing on this side is basically the sum of IS plus I external. This current here is lagging the secondary current a lot more. This means the IP crime is obviously then at a different phase angle. And this is the vectorial sum of these two currents. There's two effects that we can see very nicely from this vector diagram that we can see here. Firstly, that IS is always smaller than IP in magnitude. This current here is always a little bit smaller than IP. And this basically means that your CT will always have a negative error. It will always have a little less current coming out of it compared to the primary side or the, the ideal CT that we're measuring. And this is also what we see for, for CTs often when we measure them, that they have negative amplitude errors. And we will prove this just now in the case studies that I have. The other effect is that this IS vector is leading the IP, the ideal primary current, the transformed primary current that we see, which means that your IS will always show a positive phase angle error. Note that these vectors are obviously rotating in the counterclockwise direction, and that's why we see this leading um, effect, which means it's a positive phase angle error that we will measure for a CT typically. There's a couple of other effects that I can explain from this vector diagram here. The first one being, what is the effect of the magnetizing inductance that we see here? If our CT is in the normal operating state, meaning that the CT is not saturated, this impedance is large, which means it will have very little effect. Or well, this current here is quite small compared to that current. Only here we are showing it a little bit bigger for illustration purposes. But normally this current here is in the region of 1% or even less than compared to that current. If now this impedance here saturates or the CT saturates, this impedance here becomes much smaller because it basically becomes almost like a short circuit in the CT that happens here. So there's then a lot more current flowing down this leg compared to that leg. The effect that that has is that this vector here, the um, external or the, the, the excitation current grows in comparison to the um, secondary current. What does that do to the error? Firstly, the amplitude error becomes a lot bigger, but negative bigger because obviously IS becomes a lot smaller. So it's a bigger negative error that we've been measuring. And secondly, this vector will actually grow in this counterclockwise direction, which means the phase angle error also grows in the positive direction because IS is leading IP again. And that is an important consideration to remember that when a CT saturates, firstly, the error becomes big in the negative direction, and the phase angle becomes bigger in the positive direction, positive meaning in the positive angle direction. The second point I want to explain to you is, is this burden connected to the secondary side here. Typically, when we're testing a CT, we're short-circuiting the secondary of a CT. 
that's actually not the right thing to do because a short circuit applied here means it's an it's it's it's, it's zero impedance that we are connecting there. It's zero VA, but a certain VA actually needs to be tested at 25% of rated burden and full burden. For instance, 5 VA or 10 VA or something like that. That means it's a finite impedance. A short circuit or a, a piece of um, fuse wire is not a finite impedance. It's a zero impedance. And that is meaning that we're not testing the um, CT according to the standard. It's very important to test or to connect, if I can call it that, the rated um, burden to the CT that we're testing here. As this, as this burden here decreases or becomes, let, let's say, let's say the other way around, as it increases, it's a higher impedance, meaning that this path here, the impedance of this path here becomes bigger. The effect of that means that this current here is smaller because obviously current shies away from impedance. Current flows then more down this path here. And then the same effect as I've explained just now for the situation happens meaning that the angle error increases positively and the amplitude error increases negatively because this current becomes smaller in comparison to that current. So connecting a bigger burden to the CT means that you're actually increasing the error. And we will see this in the results just now again, is that the actual error curve becomes more negative. And if we're burdening a CT um, or if we're applying a higher burden to a CT. And then the last effect I would like to explain on this mathematical um, um, diagram that we have here is the effect of load current. If we have a certain ideal transformed primary current flowing here, this current here is always relatively constant. If we have 10% of load current flowing or 100% of load current flowing, this current is actually quite constant over the range. What changes is the current that is passed through and that comes out of the CT. What that means is that the error of the CT at low currents, meaning now at 10% of rated current, is actually bigger than at rated current. And that is why it's important sometimes to look at a CT at low currents also, at 5%, at 10%. And also the standard allows for larger deviations of a CT at lower currents compared to load currents. So the important point to make is that the current at low loads or low currents is bigger than at nominal current. Just explaining the effect of the accuracy graph of a metering CT to you and also the effect on the, the, the concept of the security factor versus the accuracy limit factor of a CT you will have a security factor that is associated with a metering CT, and you'll have an accuracy limit factor associated with a protection class CT. What the security factor is, is that it actually is taking into account that when you have a metering CT, you would like this metering CT to saturate early after nominal current. Nominal current is from zero up to nominal current that we see here at one, but if we then apply higher currents, We'd like this metering CT to saturate because it protects our sensitive energy meter that is connected to the secondary of that CT. So it is important that this security factor actually does happen or that your CT actually saturates to protect our, our energy meter. So if we're measuring the error curve of our CT and we're finding that our CT is saturating early, meaning that here the the error becomes bigger, note in the negative direction, as I've explained earlier, then this is a good thing. This is basically why this CT here is okay. If it saturates only later, then this is a fail or not so good example. And when you, you basically would like to confirm that your security factor, if you, for instance, have typically a security factor of five, the standard says for a security factor of five, the error must be at least 10%, minus 10% at five times over current. So at that point, you definitely want to make sure that your error is already bigger than the 10% than the or the minus 10%, meaning that your CT has already saturated. If it has not yet saturated, then is, that's when we're measuring this red curve here. So this core saturates too late. And that is what we want to avoid for a metering CT. The other thing that we need to consider for the security factor is the connected burden. 
And as you're applying burden, this security factor will change. If you're connecting a higher burden, your CT will saturate earlier. If you're connecting a lower burden, your CT will saturate later. Meaning if you apply a numerical C energy meter, for instance, to your CT, that is a low burden. Your CT will saturate later and you're actually trying to avoid that. That is a very important consideration to, to make when you're looking at CTs is that you are, need to be aware of underburdening your metering CTs because the effect that that has is, and this is obviously very um, pronounced and um, with numerical energy meters, that the security factor, the actual security factor shifts up with a lower burden. For protection cores, this is the other way around. For protection cores, we don't want the CT to saturate because we want the CT to measure currents up to a very high limit to a certain accuracy, not as accurate as a metering CT, but to reasonable accuracy. So the ALF is basically a similar concept to the security factor, just with opposite polarity, meaning we want to make sure that our CT measures current up to a certain overcurrent factor and beyond that. So that is why this green curve here, up to 10 times overcurrent, this here, for instance, is a, um, a, a, a 10 P5, for instance, in this case here, for, it's for 10 times overcurrent, we're measuring a 5% error. This green curve is okay. If we find that our CT is saturating earlier, meaning that it's already saturating here, somewhere about nine, then this saturates too early, which means it will not measure high currents or fault currents accurate, but certainly not to the 5% that a 5P10 specifies for you. So in this case here, the accuracy limit factor of a 5P10 is not complied with, with this red curve here. Again, the burden has an effect on this. If we are overburdening the CT, this curve will increase. If we're under, sorry, sorry, it will, will decrease. If we're underburdening, it will increase. And that is actually a good thing for, for protection CTs, that if we're underburdening the CT, that the ALF increases, because it means it's more accurate up to a higher actual ALF or accuracy limit factor. So for protection CTs, you need to be aware of overburdening a CT, because if you're overburdening a CT, it means the ALF comes down. It will then shift in this direction. Whereas when you're underburdening it, it gives you a higher um, uh, ALF, and that is actually what you want to have, meaning that you can measure higher currents for more current. Okay, enough of theory. Let's talk about the Omicron CT analyzer, which is the proposed solutions for CT calibrations. It is a portable and compact size and low weight test equipment. You can see a little picture there on the right hand side of a person sitting in a substation testing a CT. It can do field calibrations of CTs up to class 0.1 accuracy. It really is testing very fast. Um, it, you can test per core. It takes you about a minute to, to perform the test. And obviously you need to do a test for each individual core as you're testing. You then have an automatic results assessment as per the IEC 6004-1 standard, as well as um, as per the IEC 61869-2 standard, which is done obviously directly after the test has been done. You have a simulation and a reassessment um, possibility where once you've tested the CT, you can actually change the parameters and say, what if the CT had different burdens, different current flowing through it? and would it still be within the specification? It is the actual test set that you see there is always safe to operate. It never injects more than 120 volts. And with that, you can test CTs up to 30,000 to one with knee points up to many thousand volts. I think the limit is a 30 kV knee point that can be tested with this. And there's some really fancy tricks inside this test set to achieve that. And it really is very reliable because it has a high noise immunity for on-site testing. You also have an option to test multi-tap CTs with an external CTSB2 extension box, where you can then connect all five taps of a CT at the same time 
and then it will measure your 1s1, 1s2, 1s1, 1s3, 1s1, 1s4, up to 1s6 automatically and will give you one report for everything. Connection is quite easy in the way that you're needing to connect the output of the CT to the secondary side of a transformer or whatever of a CT and the CT needs to be open circuit, the secondary circuit needs to be open circuited at this point here because you don't want to measure the protection relay or the burden that is connected to the CT in parallel to the CT um, winding that you're measuring between S1 and S2. We are then measuring this point, the S1, S2, back into the first measurement input. This is really because sometimes the winding resistance that we're measuring is very, very small. And the only way that you can get an accurate measurement is by a four-wire method. And this is why you're applying this four-wire method for measurement in this case here, four wires to accurately measure the secondary winding resistance of the CT. And then you still need to connect the primary P1 and P2 back into the second input on the CT analyzer. Again, you obviously should make sure that your CT is disconnected on both sides and isolated, and also that nothing else is connected at the same time. You need to also make sure that it's earthed for safety reasons as well. Another very nice application of the CT analyzer is testing bushing type CTs. The problem with bushing type CTs is that it is very important, very difficult to test a CT sitting in a bushing here with primary current because you can't push the current through the actual primary winding of this power transformer. In this case, still the connection diagram is exactly the same. You're applying the secondary connections to the secondary of the CT and measuring that back. But then you can connect the primary side over this whole winding, including the actual transformer winding, and measure that back into the CT analyzer. You should make sure that your secondary of this power transformer, as well as the other phases, are both short circuited and grounded to take or to basically negligate the effect um, to the measurement. But with this, you could still very accurately calibrate and characterize the mathematical model of the CT sitting in the um, conductor here, just above the wind, main winding of this transformer. And the last application, which is also very nice to um, use, is for CT sitting in GIS, a gas insulated switch gear, where you also have the issue that you can't get access to the primary conductor of the and gas insulated switch here because it's obviously in gas and we normally do that by connecting again the secondary side of the CT to the secondary terminals of the CT but the primary side we connect via the earthing switch so you can connect to one side of the primary side even to the outside bushing of the GIS and then you ground you basically close the earthing switch and you connect that earthing back to the primary side of the CT analyzer and these um, cables that you see here or these test leads here can be up to 100 meters long and you still get very good results for measuring a CT that is sitting inside the GIS um, in this way that is indicated here. Okay, let's come to some case studies. And the first case study I'd like to present is a good case study, it's a good result. This is a 66 kV post type CT, 1200 amps to 1 amp, a 10 VA class 0.2 CT that we tested. And you can see that in the test software, we've entered the parameters 1200 to 1, 10 VA. We're testing this according to IEC 60044. It's a metering class CT with class 0.5, uh, class 0.2% accuracy in this specific case. And the CT analyzer did its one minute test doing the winding resistance, doing the magnetizing losses, doing the ideal transformation ratio and so forth. And it came back with the results here. We can see here the measured um, um, secondary winding resistance. It will measure that at ambient temperature. It will then transform it up or model it up to 75 degrees, which is the modeling um, temperature at which you should um, measure the, um, the, the operating or the, the, the winding resistance of a CT. We then did the excitation current test, and you can see down here, I think I also have a little curve here, there we go, 
the actual excitation curve of the CT was recorded. And we can see that at about 2 milliamps, around about 70 volts or something like that, that is where we have the, the actual knee point. There we can see the knee point voltage as well as the knee point current. And it also determines here the saturated inductance as well as the as well as the unsaturated, the normal inductance. You can see that the normal inductance, 149 Henry, is obviously much larger than the saturated inductance at 0 0.005 Henry. So that's a factor of a thousand smaller, basically. And that is the effect of the slope of this curve versus the slope of that curve. So this is this, the slope of the inductance. Here is the unsaturated, and that is the saturated inductance. That we see here, the slope of these curves. And then there was a ratio test done and it determined that this CT is a 1199,34 um, to 1, which is a 0.054% error and polarity in this specific case is okay. So that is the results that we get from the CT when we are testing with the CT analyzer. Over and above that, the CT analyzer also produces us with a table for the accuracy of the CT, firstly at different currents, because the standard specifies that you need to test a CT at 5%, 20%, 100%, 120% 100%, current, as well as full burden and quarter burden. So in this case, that would have been 10 VA and 2.5 and VA. You will now ask, well, why does the CT analyzer give you results here for 1%, 10%, 50%, and 200%? as well as also the results here for a burden of half the 10 VA, as well as an eighth of the 10 VA. Well, it's really just for information. The important points are really this, these two, and also the same here, the same here, and the same here. This is really additional information that the CT analyzer gives you, which is almost like a complete operating diagram of the CT. It also plots both the current ratio error as well as the phase angle error over the primary current of the CT. And it then shows you here also what are the limits that the CT has to lie within. So in this case, it's a class 0.2 MCT. So obviously between 100% and 120%, the error is not allowed to be larger than plus or minus 0.2% between the HV or the primary and the secondary. In this specific case, you can see also that the results for both 10 VA, even 2.5 VA, and the other VAs are all very much on top of each other. This really is a very good CT. That's why these curves are firstly right on the zero line and they're right on top of each other. There's very little dependence and very little deviation for the CT over the current range as well as over the burden range. It's always very, very accurate. The same can be said for the phase angle error where we've also plotted now the phase angle error here. Now we're plotting the phase in minutes on the vertical axis here. You can see, again, for all different burdens connected, it is always very close to zero minutes between the primary and the secondary. And the actual numerical results, you can see at the top here in the table, as you can see it there. So this is a very good CT. There's really nothing that is wrong with the CT. And you can definitely sign and certify the CT for good operation. Let's now look at a CT, which is 100 amp to 1 amp, 10 VA class 0.1, a class 1 CT. So it's a slightly different accuracy class, class 1. Here we again entered 100 to 1. It is a 10 VA. It's again tested at, at IC 600044-1. It's a metering CT, and it's a class 1. The measured re resistance is shown here. Again, we can see here the MAC curve that was measured, as well as down here, we can see the accuracy of the CT given at 100 to 1 at 0.004% and at 1.26 minutes, which all looks perfect. Really nothing wrong with this. And you could actually pass the CT and not really worry about it until you look at the actual detail. And the detail means that you need to look firstly at the various different currents. 5%, 20%, 100%, and 120% are the important currents, as well as also different burdens connected to the CT. 10%, 2.5%, 10 VA, quarter burden, and one eighth of a burden. 
And there you can see that at 10 VA, the CT here is actually looking quite fine. It's minus 0.86% error, minus 7.9% error, which is quite good. As I've explained earlier, you will always find for a, an error, for a CT that it's got a slightly negative error for the amplitude, which you can see here very nicely. You can see also as you are decreasing the burden, as you are lessening the, the burden or the load on the CT, this curve shifts up. Or the other way around, if you're burdening a CT, the curve will drop down. It's almost like a car. As you load it up, it will sag down. Okay, so there you can see that for 1.25 VA, you're at the top here, and then as you're burning it up, it sags down. So there we can see that this is actually quite making quite a large effect on the accuracy graph of the CT, the burden that was connected. At 10 VA, which is the blue curve here, we can see we are just skirting the bottom um, line that we have here. It's all still okay, it all looks, still looks quite fine. But if we're looking at lesser burden, this curve actually shifts up to the extent that at 1.25 VA, we're actually above the 1% error that is specified for the CT. And that is really the two points that I would like to make here. Is here you can see this point here, and um, this was um, at, uh, that's at 20%. We are just below the, in, in this case, you're actually allowing um, one and a half times the error because this is only at 20%. You can see that's 1.48, which is just below the limit of 1.5, whereas here we are already above the 1% for the CT. Here again, you can see what I've explained earlier in the mathematical model, that firstly, at lower currents, the CT error will be bigger and it will be negative. And as you're coming into the nominal range of the CT, you will have good results. And secondly, as you're loading a CT up, the results become more negative. It sags down um, and the error curve was pulled down in the negative direction. So you get a more negative current ratio error, as you can see in these graphs here. Looking at the phase angle error, you have a similar effect. Note that I mentioned earlier that the phase angle error for a CT typically is positive because the secondary is leading the um, transformed um, current from the primary. And at lower currents, this leading error is bigger. And as you are then coming into the load area here, we have a very good phase angle error here. We're well within the limits that are specified by the standards here. So these are results are all looking good and acceptable. The limit here would be 60 minutes, which is exactly one degree. Um, that, we, that, that is the limit that is specified by the standard. And we are well within that 60 minutes, actually quite a bit less than that um, in each case. So. This is for a class one CT. And then let's look at a third case study, which is a 300 to one 15 VA protection core this case, in this case. So again, we've entered here a 300 to one 15 VA. We're testing here according to IEC 61869-2, and it's a protection core and it's a 5P protection core that we are looking at. It's the 5P 15 um, CT that we are testing here. So 5P and the 15 that you see there. And again, it measured the resistance, it measured the excitation current, and it also measured the results at rated current. But for a protection core, these are not the important points. A protection core is not supposed to measure current accurately at nominal current. The important point here is the ALF. And in this specific case here, the ALF should have been 30. That the 5P 30 that was specified down here. And if we look at this, the actual ALF that was measured for the CT was 38. You can now make up in your mind, is that good or is that bad? Remember what I've said about the ALF and for protection core CTs, you wanna have an ALF that is bigger than the limit. In this case, the limit is 30, we have 38. So that is good, which means we have, we will measure current accurately to a 5% error up to 38 times the, um, in primary current of the CT, which means we can actually measure this quite nicely and accurately. This really depends on the excitation curve of the CT. And this is also why for protection cores, you find that the excitation current and the excitation voltage of a CT is much higher for a protection core. The way that we define an excitation 
um, or the knee point is that for a 10% increase in voltage, or that's actually the core voltage inside the city, you want to see a 50% increase in current um, um, with magnetizing current measured by the CT. That's as looking from the secondary side of the CT. So that is what the definition of the knee point is. So at this point here, we have for a 10% increase in voltage, the current will shoot up by 50%. Obviously, the CT analyzer determines that automatically for you. In this case, it means that the voltage is 504 volts at a current of 0 0.031 amps or 31 milliamps. And then we can also plot these results here. In this case, as I've already said, the actual amplitude or current ratio error at these, all these different currents are not as important. The only specification that there is for a protection core is that at rated current, so at 100% current, the, the CT must not be or must be within plus or minus 1% of ratio. That is the only um, uh, specification that is made for a protection core. And in this case, you can clearly see that we are complying with that requirement. So the CT is obviously um, accurate in that case. The ALF is good. We can also see that this 1% is adhered to for any burden connected. So that is all very good and really a CT that can be very much accepted and passed. Okay, so that's CTs for us. Let's come to voltage transformers. Because I quickly oil my throat a little bit. It is a blistering hot day here in Cape Town today. Quite contrary to the rest of the country, I believe. So when we're talking about VTs or voltage transformers, the approach taken for calibration and testing is actually very similar as for CTs. But what you will find out now is that when you're testing and looking at VTs, that VTs are actually much more accurate devices or much more complex devices compared to a CT. And this is the, um, trans the model that we have here for a voltage transformer. You will again recognize, if you ignore this top portion here, here you will see the classical model, mathematical model for any transformer. This again meaning that these are the iron losses of the VT. Here we have the copper losses or the secondary copper losses of the VT. What is new now is that we also have copper losses for the primary because on the VT you have considerable amount of windings on the primary side. So we need to model those accurately and that is why we have this RP double crime both as a resistance as well as a reactance. And also what is different for a VT is that we can have multiple windings for a VT. And these windings are all on the same core. And that is really a big difference to, VT, to CTs. In CTs, if you have different, if you have a measurement core and a protection core, and they are normally on separate cores, which means you have to look at them totally independently of each other. But for a VT, they are all on the same core. So they will influence each other. And that is also why they will, will need to be modeled at the same time as well. And that is really the big difference between VTs or calibrating VTs compared to CTs, that you need to um, take care of these other windings, obviously assuming that your VT has multiple secondary windings, that you need to allow and that you model these secondary windings. So the parameters to determine is again very similar as before, that we need to determine the secondary winding resistances, but we need to determine them for each of the secondary and windings that we have, R1 and R2. We also need to determine the secondary short circuit impedances. Those are these whole impedances that we see here, R1 and X1. And again, we need to determine that for each of the windings as well as the primary of the VT. So the RP and the XP. And then lastly, we need to model the nonlinear iron losses. And this actually means that we firstly need to model this magnetizing resistance as well as this inductance here. And this inductance for a VT behaves in a very similar way as for a CT. It actually is a MAC curve that we're recording. We are recording a MAC curve for a VT. And the reason why we do that is because even a 
the core of a VT will saturate somewhere, hopefully way above nominal voltage, but it will saturate and that will have an effect and an influence on the accuracy of the VT. The test solution is a similar test solution as a CT analyzer, but this is actually a separate piece of test equipment, which is called the Vortano 100, which is the solution for VT calibrations. It's also portable and compact size, but it actually consists of two units, the actual main unit, which is the Vortano 100, as well as the VBO2 booster unit that we see here. And these are still lightweight and transportable. This still gives us the ability to do field calibrations of VTs up to class 0.1 accuracy in the field. With this solution here, we can, make, we can actually test VTs with up to five secondary windings at the same time. And remember what I said earlier, it's the standard um, specifies that you need to test the, each of the secondary windings and the effect of these windings on each other. So that's why you need to test them at the same time. So just treating a winding on its own is not good enough. You need to test them all at the same time. We then also have a software guided test procedure, which ensures a short testing time. In this case, it's not quite as fast as the CT analyzer. Here it takes you about 20 minutes for a typical two to three winding and CT, a VT. The automatic results assessment is done according to the IEC 600 double four dash two and the IEC 61869 dash three standards. You also have the option of doing a simulation and a reassessment of the test with changed VT parameters, meaning different burdens connected, different primary voltages applied to the VT. And what is very important about VT testing is that safety is a major consideration when you're testing a VT. There is a, firstly, these two different units, and they are separated in what we call the safe area. So that is where the tester or the, the, the technician would normally be standing. And then we have the high voltage environment, which is separate, and it's only connected by these few wires here. So there's good isolation between the high voltage and the test equipment. There's also double action to start the test implemented, which means that we are um, you needing not only once to press a button, but you need to press it once, and then you need to acknowledge that you want to inject. The reason being that if you are primary of that VT. So it is very important to um, take care of that and be careful about that. Plus and lastly, obviously, there is an emergency off button that you can hit in case something goes wrong. Okay, so let's look at some case studies again. And this is a 33 kV to 110 volt post type CT, 30 VA. It had two windings, a class 0.5 and a 3P winding. So a metering winding and a protection winding. So in our test software, we entered that this is a 33 kV Note this divided by root 3 factor because the, even at 33 kV, this VT is a VT per phase. So the actual VT only measures line to neutral voltage. That is why we divide by root 3 in this specific case. You can obviously have line to line connected VTs and software does take care of that. But in this case, it was a line to neutral connected VT. We want to test according to IEC 600-44-2. Our first winding here is a class 0.5 metering winding, note at 110 divided by root 3, because obviously on the secondary of that VT, we're only measuring 63.51 volts, which is the line to neutral voltage and not the line to line voltage. Then we have a second winding here, which in this case is a 3P winding, a protection winding. And both these windings are rated at 30 VA at a power factor of 0.8. Down here, you can see the results of the winding resistance for both windings, the ratio test conducted, as well as also obviously the phase angle error and the polarity that was measured for this VT. But what is what much more in interesting is, for instance, the excitation curve. And in this case, note that this voltage that we see here, we're plotting voltage on the vertical axis versus current on the horizontal axis. And you can see that this 
excitation curve is very linear with the whole range of the VT, and normal operating voltage is round about here. You can see here 100 volts. That's obviously 100 volts face the neutral. So we are looking at 63 and a half volts, which is round about there. The excitation current at that voltage would be round about um, 0.1. I'm sorry, that probably would be um, less than an amp between 0.1 and, a, and an amp in this specific case. But the important point is that this curve is linear. And even for higher voltages, because um, at, you need to also calibrate this VT for 120%. And sometimes the standard also calls if your VT has a FV factor, that is now the over voltage factor of 1.9, then you need to test your, volt, your VT up to 1.9 over voltage. You want to make sure that your excitation curve is linear all the way up to 1.9 over voltage factor. In this case, the FV factor or the over voltage factor is 1.2. So we are only testing up to 120% of nominal voltage in this specific case. The results of ratio error and phase angle error are also presented in a table. This is now for both windings for all the different test cases that you will have. The important one to look at is firstly, we're testing the first winding at full burden and at quarter burden. And you can see here the different ratio errors and the phase angle errors for 80, 100, and 120% of the uh, voltage primary, uh, primary voltage applied. So you can see here, obviously, this VT is quite accurate within the 0.5% that was specified for all those points that you see here. Um, and this VT really is quite good. Then we test the same VT for the other winding, which is the protection core. Again, at full burden and at quarter burden. And here we test it at 2%, 5%, 100%. And in this case, FF, remember, was 1.2. So this is 120% of the voltage. And again, you can see that this VT is well within 3P, means it's 3%. We're well within the 3% of this VT. And note again that this error also is slightly negative for the protection VT. This fits in with that statement made earlier that you always have negative errors for protection cores. For metering cores, that's not always the case because they are compensated. So this is basically looking at the two windings independently of each other. But now comes the crux. You also need to look at the first winding with the second winding loaded fully. And then you can see here that these um, ratio errors here change from 0 0.008 to 0 0.07 in this case, for instance, for 80% of voltage applied. And the same the other way around. For the um, protection core, you need to measure the accuracy of the protection core while the metering core is fully burdened. And these are the results that you see down here. Now, these numbers are very difficult to interpret just looking at these results that you see here. And um, yeah, you can look at them and the software also highlights certain numbers that are beyond the um, limits that are specified by the standard. But if you look at the graphs, this actually makes so much more sense. And here you can see the ratio error, firstly, of the class 0.1 winding. You can see here that's the 0.5% limit from 80% up to 120%. So this VT basically needs to be within these two red lines for the range of 80% to 120% of voltage for both being 100% loaded and 25% loaded. And you can see here that these results here very much fall into that category. At 100% load, you've got virtually 0% error. If it's lightly loaded, it's a slight positive error that you're measuring there, but it's all still well within the range of this VT and very much acceptable in that specific case. Note that this test was done for the other windings not loaded. And now I'm going to show you the results. What happens if you load the other, loaded, uh, other windings? So this is the exact same winding, but with the other winding, that being the, the 3P winding, loaded. And compare these two curves. Can you see what happens? Just look at the blue curve here, for instance. There you can see the blue curve is exactly at 0%. And down here, this curve sits slightly below the 0% line which means it's shifted down. It was actually loaded up. This is exactly the same effect as I've explained for CTs, that when you're loading up, when you're increasing the burden on a VT, 
you're dragging the curve down, it becomes more negative. That is what you're seeing here, that now the error is more negative. Still very much within the class 0.5% error here, the minus 0.5% obviously is a important one here. So you're still totally fine, but the effect is what I'd like to explain. Here. I hope this makes sense, okay? Let's look at the phase angles. These are the results for the phase angles for the same metering winding. The first one on the top here is the other winding not loaded, and the bottom one is with the other windings loaded with ratio load. But note that here, the phase angle error with the other winding not loaded, you are basically at 0%. And both the 100% and 25% load curves are right on top of each other. Slap bang at zero minutes, you can see here on the vertical axis, between zero and scale between zero and 25 minutes, you've got a very accurate VT with very little phase angle error here. And down here, when the other windings are loaded, you can see that this phase angle has increased slightly, still very much within the plus minus 20 minutes error that you can have. 20 minutes would be the equivalent of 0.3 degrees, 0.33 degrees, because 60 minutes is one degree basically. But you can still see here that obviously the angle has increased in this specific case. And now it's sitting here at something like two minutes in this case. Note that here it's lagging, it's actually dragging it down as well. That is a slightly different effect for VTs as compared for CTs. So these two, two curves that I've shown you here, or these four curves that I've shown you, is only for the class 0.5 um, metering winding of this VT. Let's now look at the second winding, meaning the 3P winding. This is the protection winding. And these are the results for the other windings not loaded. So that's basically looking just at the protection winding without anything connected to the metering winding of this VT. And there you can see that the accuracy graph is actually very accurate at 0%. And for a 3P winding, the limits is 3%. So there you can see 3% all the way from 5% up to 120% of this VT. So we are well within that 3% limit for all those voltages. Right down here, between 2% and 5%, we've got slightly increased limits, where the limits actually increase from 3% up to 6%, or double the 3P limit that is specified. This is for the other windings not loaded. This is the graph for the other windings loaded. So that's now the metering winding loaded with rated load. And you can see here also very little difference. You can hardly see a difference. If you look at the actual numbers of the table that I've shown earlier, you can probably identify a very small little deviation. And um, that this curve here, again, the effect would be that it's dragging down. You will see that the curve would be dragged down a little bit, but it's tiny little bit in this case, well within the 3P limit or the 3% limit that was specified we are 100% with this VT, don't need to worry about this at all. And the same is true for the phase angle error. You can see here also for both full load and 25% load with the other windings not loaded, it's at zero, at zero minutes in this case. And when we load the metering winding, also very much at zero for both 100% load and 25% load. So this VT here is really not an issue. And specifically, the 3P winding is obviously very much very good in this case. Although the important one to look at obviously is the metering winding, as you've seen earlier. Let's now look at a VT, which was not so good. And again, this is a two winding VT, 66 kV to 110 volts. It's a 100 VA winding, both the metering and the protection. And it's a class 0.2 for the winding one and a 3P protection winding for the winding two. And you can already see here that um, the test results um, scream at me that this test was failed, it was not good enough. You can see here we entered all the settings, 66 kV divided by root three, divide, uh, tested according to IEC 6004-2, up to 1.2, first winding is a class 0.2, it's 110 volt winding divided by root three, and the second winding is a 3P at 110 divided by square root of three, and these are both 100 VA windings that we're testing. And down here you can see 
the winding resistance and the ratio errors that we can see. And if you look at these ratio errors here, you can say, well, what's the problem? If you look at the first winding, it's 0.01% accurate at rated voltage. And the second winding is minus 0.05% error, also no problem. Six degree lagging phase angle error, also no problem. What is the issue? The error or the, the, the problem lies in the detail. And look at this. This is the magnetization or the excitation curve for this specific VT. And you can see here already that this v curve is not as straight as the other result that I showed earlier. You can see that at about 60, you can see here this is um, voltages on the vertical axis, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, about 50 volts. This curve starts to saturate already, which means at 63 volts, we are already well into the saturation of this CT. And most certainly, if you're looking at 1.2 times nominal voltage, will be somewhere in this area here, which means at that point, the VT is already very saturated. And that has an effect on the accuracy of the VT. And we will see this just now in the results, the detailed results, which are shown here numerically. We can see here that at 100%, this VT looks good. These are the numbers that I showed earlier, the 0 0.0188. And the other one was this one down here. I think it's, I need to just go one step back here. 0188, and the other one was minus 0 0.0592. And that is that one down here, the 0 0.0592. Those are obviously looking good. But where the problem comes in is that if I'm looking at my VT, the metering side at 80%, it's already exceeding the 0.2% um, error limit. And if I'm then loading the other winding, oh, horrible things are happening here. You can see here all are highlighted that these are exceeding the accuracy of this metering um, winding on this VT. The protection core or the protection winding is looking good. It's looking fine in this specific case. So in this case, only the metering winding is problematic, particularly with the other windings loaded. If we now look at the results graphically, we can see this illustrated a bit more or a bit better. So here we can see that this curve, you can firstly see that this curve is not as linear and as straight as the previous curve that are shown, but particularly when we're coming up to 80%, up to 80%, it's not so bad. But note at 100%, it already starts pointing down. At 120%, it's pointing down even more. And that is the effect of saturation of this specific VT that we're measuring here. And note earlier what I said is when you're saturating, that inductance decreases. That means more current flows down the magnetizing impedance. That is why we're measuring a larger error at that point. And we can also see that this VT here is quite dependent on the load that is connected. At 100% load, it's not so bad. It's still within the 0.2% limits that are shown here. But at 25% load, quarter load, this one definitely exceeds that limit at that point there and fails the test that we need to do. This is for the other windings not loaded. Watch what happens if I load, if I load the other windings. Can you compare the two curves? Can you see how the curves are dragged down? Because now the, the protection core is also loaded, which means that it basically drags down the overall load on the accuracy of this VT. And here we can now see, now at 100% load, we're definitely way beyond the 0.2% error limit that we have here. And only the quarter burden results are within the plus or minus 0.2% error limits that we are showing here. The problem here is that normally when one is testing VTs, you hardly ever have the facility and the test equipment available to test, for instance, at 120% of nominal voltage or to test at different burdens, as you can see here, at 100% and at quarter percent burden. And this is really a big case for um, the, 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 the modeling approach, where it really gives you the accuracy for all these different cases, because it's all done in a modeling type of environment to get these curves out of your results. These are now the results for the metering core. Let's now look at the phase angle error. And the phase angle error shows us that for the other windings not loaded, we were within the limits of plus or minus 10 minutes for the metering winding, both for 20% load and for 100% load. So this is all very perfect 
and looks pretty good in this specific case. However, when we load the protection winding, that's what happens. And the results for the 100% load actually are below or beyond the 10 minutes limit that is specified for a metering VMs VT that we have here or a class point two metering VT. So here also this VT doesn't only fail the results for the ratio error, both for the for the 80% when the other windings are not loaded and the 120% when the ratio when, when the other windings is loaded, it also fails the phase angle error limit um, when the other windings are loaded. Quite frankly, in my opinion, this VT is not good for service. <clears throat> okay, so we are coming towards the end of our presentation. Just a few words about certifications and calibrations. Firstly, the certifications. Um, I'd just like to mention this because the modeling approach is a different way of testing a VT or a CT using this modeling approach. And initially it was met by a lot of criticism and, and people weren't quite sure if this is a good way to go. And that is why Omicron went to the PTB, which is the Physikalisch Technische Bundesanstalt in Germany, which is really the SABS equivalent in Germany, but it's really a world-renowned institute where they are certifying test equipment, energy meters, anything that needs to be certified is certified at the PTB. And they got a CT analyzer for a year to test with that. And after the year, after many, many tests with their other reference equipment that they had and their reference CT where they know how these CTs are behaving, they came back and they gave Omicron a certificate saying that truly the CT analyzer is good enough to test any VT with primary range currents of 5 amps up to 5,000 5, amps, anything within a burden from 0 to 10 VA to an accuracy of class 0.02% and a phase angle error of one minute. What this means is that you, obviously the typical CT that you will see in the field is class 0.2, maybe in the exceptional case, you will see a class 0.1% accurate CT. But with this test that you can see here, at the reference instrument, the CT analyzer being your, your sub-reference or your, your field reference, at class 0.02%, you are, a factor of at least five to 10 times more accurate than the, um, the actual test object that you're testing. And this is well suited for this kind of calibrations and this kind of tests. And the same was done for the VT. And this was done a few years later. And here the test was done at different test points. And again, you can see that the difference or the error that they certified this VT, uh, the Votano for is also in the region of 0.02% in amplitude, as well as in the region of 0.5 minutes for the different operating conditions that they've specified here. So again, the Botano also is very much good for testing VTs in the field, most certainly class 0.2, even class 0.1 VTs in the field, and obviously also all the other protection winding VTs as well. One other aspect that comes to this is the calibration of CT analyzers and Votano, because this really gives you a high metering accuracy that you can take out into the field to calibrate a VT or a CT. And this is really where the um, calibration of this equipment comes in. And these two equipment, because they are so accurate, they have to be certified in the accuracy at least or not at least, but normally once a year, and where you can send them to us, we can calibrate them. We have got very accurate reference equipment here, where we calibrate the VT, the Votano, as well as the CT analyzer against these references of known accuracy, and we can then certify that your CT analyzer and your Votano is still within spec and within calibration. But because this is metering equipment, it needs to be done yearly. This is unfortunately the way that it is specified even by the typical calibration standards that are applicable to calibration and energy measurement equipment. Okay, so coming to an end, I'd like to summarize um, what I have presented today. 
the regular and accurate verification of instrument transformers as required by the code of electricity metering can conveniently be conducted in the field by utilizing a modeling verification instead of following a conventional primary injection calibration. So that is using a CT analyzer or a Votano instead of a primary injection, which requires a lot of equipment and obviously also has a problem when you want to take it out into the field because of the size and the weight of such test equipment. The modeling approach consists of accurately characterizing the electrical model of a CT or a VT, then calculating the amplitude and the phase angle accuracy of the device under test for the required burden connected. And note that I put connected in inverted commas because it's a mathematical modeling approach um, in this specific case. So of the required burden connected to the CT or VT and then injecting, again, this is a mathematic, mathematical number crunching exercise, the required primary current or primary voltage through that model and working out what is the accuracy in terms of amplitude and phase angle for the CT or VT that you're testing. The calibration of inductive CTs is done according to IEC 6004-1 or IEC 61869-2 whereby we verify the very accuracy of a CT at 5, 20, 100, and 120% of nominal current, both at 25% and 100% burden. And you will remember that for the CT, we're actually doing it at one, also at 1%, at 10%, at 50%, and also at 200% of nominal current, and the burden being at 12.5% and at 50% burden as well. So it really does quite a lot more. Again, it's all number crunching, and it's basically done at the press of a button. The calibration of inductive VTs um, is done according to IEC 6004-2, as well as IEC 61869-3. And this basically specifies that the accuracy verification for a metering winding needs to be done at 80%, 100%, and 120% of nominal voltage, both at 25% of rated burn and at full burn for the VT. And this needs to be done both for all the other windings being unloaded as well as fully loaded. So both those scenarios need to be done. And in the um, results that are presented, you will remember that I've shown you all these different graphs for the VTs. This is really for all the different scenarios that um, can exist, particularly for multi-winding voltage transformers. I've presented various case studies for both metering and protection CTs and VTs, both with past results as well as with failed results. And we, I think we presented those and we've um, discussed the results to quite a lot of detail, but I'm sure that there will also be some comments just now in the questions about these results that I've presented. And the PDB and other certification institutes, and um, for instance, and another one that I can think of the top of my head is the Chinese Certification Institute, um, I'm not sure where it is, but they've also certified the CT analyzer accuracy, for instance. They have certified the accuracy of the modeling approach to test and calibrate instrument transformers in the field. And obviously the size and the transportability of these devices make it very attractive to use this for field calibration of both CTs and VTs. And with that, I think I'm at the end of my presentation, so I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, I have given you my email address at the bottom here, alex at electrics.co.za. So if you have any specific questions or would like to discuss this a bit further, please contact me. I've also given you my mobile telephone number there um, in case you want to contact me. Um, but I'm also going to attend to the questions now. So, okay. Um, yes, Alex. Uh, there's no questions for you in the question box. But I think that brings us now to the end of the event. <laughs> um, yes, Alex. Uh, first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank you for the effort that has gone into your presentation. Um, I believe that our attendees found it interesting and it's very relevant to our industry. And hopefully we can do, do it again in the near future. Well, absolutely. I think it um, depends on the feedback that we get from the from the listeners. I hope they weren't um, too much gobsmacked by the theory and by all the numbers and the graphs and so forth. 
But um, if they feel this was a good presentation, they should give us a good feedback. And then most certainly we will um, do a similar session again somewhere in the near future. Yeah, it, was a, it, was a, it was an excellent presentation. Uh, there is a couple of people I still need to thank. Um, I'd like to thank Minx for all the behind the scenes work. Uh, Minx was responsible for setting up the webinar. She also did the CPD points application and uh, she also advertised the event on our behalf. Then uh, lastly, I'd like to thank our attendees. Uh, we had a healthy attendance uh, this afternoon, I think about 50 people. And um, I'd like to thank you for your participation. Uh, please remember to register for our next events on our website, saie.org.za. And until next time, say, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. So can you say there were really no questions, in other words? No, none. Nothing, nothing at all that you could pick up. Thank you, Alex. Just from one person that I see here. Good. Good. Well, that means that it, it, it means two things. Either I've done a good job, or it means that people will cost me too much. So we'll see. <laughs> Are you sending out tomorrow morning? <laughs> Are you sending out a um, Minx maybe can answer that for us. Um, are you sending out a feedback um, form afterwards to all the attendees? Is Minx online? Is she 